time, Hebrews 11.32, what more shall I say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms and did much more than even that. Brothers and sisters, again, our subject this morning is stop acting like that. Let's get into it. When we consider last week's sermon, we really were dealing with the fact that there is no condemnation for believers. That's what we were dealing with. There's no condemnation for believers. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is clear and this is faithful. And this is certainly the heart of the gospel and the heart of God for you and I. But we have to ask the question, what about actions then? I mean, I hear you and I believe and scripture is faithful. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. And there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But what about my behavior? What about actions? Brothers and sisters, there is a beautiful, beautiful relationship between faith and works. Um, Bible tells us very faithfully that faith works together with actions because the actions make faith mature or complete. Um, I want you to look at it this way. Faith is the first step. It is the first step that places you and I on the road to reconciliation with God. And this is the core subject of Paul's teaching. Behaviors, which is the core subject of the epistle of James, behaviors, um, what's their part in it? Behaviors based on faith or behaviors of people of faith, they're the next step. What faith does is faith does what behavior can't do. That's why it's the first step. You can't prove yourself to God. The best you can do is have faith to believe in him because you'll never be able to work your way into good graces with him. So faith steps in to connect you to God. Actions follow the faithful because because what they do is they prove God to other people. You see, you have to understand that what behaviors do is they demonstrate that God is real because you become the living example. This is why, this is why, why, why your, your, your actions are a part of proving that there is indeed a will of God. Your actions demonstrate that you have a relationship with God. They become the proof for other people. Faith and work should be together. There is a very close relationship between the two. And to restate it one more time, faith is the first step and it produces behavior. Behavior then makes faith mature or complete. You can't have one without the other. And you certainly have to start from a foundation of faith. And, 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 and there's so much more on that subject. Um, Book of Romans, many of the epistles um, will concentrate on the role of faith. We saw it in Jesus' interaction uh, with the man on the cross. We, we also see that this relationship of behavior to faith is covered well in the Bible. And for your key reading, read the epistle of James. You do well to recognize there's a beautiful relationship. And because there's a beautiful relationship, there's a goal for us as Christians. And the goal is for our faith to mature and for our behavior to mature as well. So let's deal with some red flags for Christians. For Christians, you believe in Jesus, um, you want to be well matched in your faith and your behavior. 
And there's some red flags, uh, some things we want to avoid. Um, because when stuff doesn't match, uh, it, it confuses other people and it'll ultimately confuse your own life. I was watching an interview with one of the Olympic coaches and uh, it was so interesting because uh, as soon as I saw the coach, I was like, oh, okay, that's the coach for the Olympics, but he looks a little thugged out. That's cool. I mean, if that's your thing, you know, he, he looked rough. He just looked like the kind of guy that uh, you, you wouldn't want to talk to him the wrong way. You know, I'm, I'm, you know I'm, I'm not saying he's that kind of guy or anything, but I'm just saying that's how he looked. That was his presentation of himself. Uh, guy looked rough. And then the guy talked kind of softly. And so I was confused because you look rough, but you talk kind of soft. And I was like, that's cool, though. I like that because you, you, you keep people guessing. You keep them wondering. OK, but then it got more confusing because then then he looked real rough, but then he started talking faithful talk. And I was like, OK, I think I like where I'm going. But then all of a sudden, his faithful talk turned into some kind of weird mysticism talk. And and brother started talking about stuff. Uh, uh, I won't even go into it, but brother started talking about some stuff to confuse me. So I didn't know if he was a magician or a Christian or a thug or a gentleman because stuff wasn't matching. Um, his presentation of himself, uh, his conversation, his behaviors, they were all kind of mixed matched. I didn't know who I was talking to. I didn't know who I was listening to, I mean. Brothers and sisters, that's, that's kind of what we're talking about as Christians. As Christians, we ought to have a presentation of ourselves that, that matches what we believe down on the inside. And what we believe down on the inside ought not be just our own opinion because our opinions are befuddled, confused, and a mess. But what we believe on the inside, down at the deepest level, ought to be the word of God. And once we solidify what we believe, then our presentation of ourselves becomes matched well with what we believe. And as long as you still have confusion on the inside, uh, you will give a confusing presentation of who you are on the outside. Uh, my brothers and my sisters, I want to suggest to you that that's not how you want to live. And that's not how you want to act. And for Christians, we want our behavior to match our faith. So there, there's, some, there's some red flags that, that we need to look for many red flags, but for today's consideration, we're, going to, we're only going to lift up three of them, three of them. Let me give you the first two fairly quickly. Uh, uh, red flag number three, red flag number three is disobedience. Uh, when you find disobedience in your life, that's, that's a red flag uh, that your faith and behavior are not matching. Um, disobedience is a very dangerous action. If you think about it, disobedience uh, puts a Christian back in touch with the kind of behaviors that the Bible ascribes to sons of disobedient and of disobedience and the children of Satan. So that's why we don't want to hang out in disobedience because it puts us in touch with the exact opposite of who we are. We don't want to act like sons of disobedience, nor do we want to act like the children of Satan. But the truth is, Christians don't tend to know what God says and then just willfully say, all right, God, that's what you're saying. I believe it. I accept it. And I'm just going to do the opposite today because I just feel like being disobedient. Typically, that's not how Christians find themselves caught up into disobedience. We tend to find ourselves caught up into disobedience because we actually haven't settled our beliefs. Or we find ourselves caught up into disobedience, not because we didn't accept what the word of God has to say, but because we don't like it. Um, an example is very, 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 very simply found in the gospel according to John. In chapter six, you'll notice in verse 66 that people walked away from Jesus. And the Bible records that the reason that they had been following them, him around but stopped following him around is because they didn't actually believe. So on the outside, they looked like Jesus followers because they followed him. But when the time came for them to make a choice, they walked away and the Bible says their disobedience was fueled by the fact that they didn't actually believe what they had been listening to. My brothers and my sisters, that's a, a red flag for Christians. 
you'll find yourselves falling into disobedience uh, when you don't believe what the word of God says. Read it, but not believe it is a very dangerous place to be. And the other thing is, is, uh, is when you just don't like what Jesus says. You all remember that rich young ruler. The Bible says that he approached Jesus fairly well. He clearly knew that Jesus was the authority and the master teacher. And he knew that he was connected to God. And so he came to him well, but the Bible records that he walked away from Jesus at Jesus' word because he was sad at what Jesus had to say compared to his own life. And so he found himself in disobedience, not because he wasn't around Jesus and not even because he didn't believe in Jesus or accept him, but what we know is that he found himself in disobedience because he was saddened. In other words, he didn't like it. This is a very dangerous place for us to be as Christians, and it's a real thing, because not everything that God has to say do you like at a personal level. There are just some things, because his ways are different than ours, that sometimes will hit you at a level where you know God said it, and you know God's requiring you to do it, but you don't like it. If you get to that place, be careful. It's a flag. And you need to be mindful that you don't fall into disobedience. Red flag number two. Red flag number two is this, is when you know better, but don't do better. Red flag number two, knowing better, but not doing better. We referenced last week uh, some parables from, from the gospel according to Matthew. Uh, we, we, we referenced them. Matthew 25, there are two interesting parables that we just want to call to our attention very quickly. Uh, one parable was the parable of the virgins and the bridegroom. The other parable was the parable of the talents. We referenced them. Let me say a little bit more about them under this, this point number two uh, of knowing better but not doing better. You see, the problem with the virgins in the parable of the virgins and the bridegroom is not that they didn't know because they did know what was going on. They knew that the bridegroom was coming, but some of them decided to be prepared. Others decided not to do better, even though they knew the bridegroom was coming. They all got sleepy and they all went to sleep and the bridegroom showed up while they were slumbering. And those that had prepared were able to get up from their slumber and still be in good standing. But those who did not prepare they were cast out. And the problem, again, is not that they didn't know, they knew, but they didn't do better with what they knew. The parable of the man that got the one talent. the problem with him was not that he didn't know. His own testimony was that the master of the money, uh, the master of the talent would come back, that he would show up, that, that his own testimony is that the master does what the master wants to do. So he knew that the master would show up, but he didn't do better. He didn't do anything with what he was given. He just buried it. And because he chose to not do better with what he knew, he was cast out. Red flag number three, I wanna go backwards for your note taking. Red flag number three is disobedience. Red flag number two is knowing better, not doing better. And now let's get to red flag number one, which is where we want to spend uh, most of our time and attention here uh, for these next few moments. Red flag number one is to have a cavalier, wasteful attitude. If you want to not match your behavior with your faith, this is where you ought to hang out. Have a cavalier attitude. Have a wasteful attitude, you know, cavalier, you know, eh, whatever, that whatever attitude, wasteful, that, that thing that makes you have something but do nothing with it, or have something and do the wrong thing with it so that it wasn't used well. This is where we come to Samson for our consideration. And I want you to stay with us because notice we started by reading that the record of divine history is that Samson is counted amongst the faithful, the best of the best. 
He made the list with the likes of David and Samuel. He made the list in the chapter in Hebrews with Abraham. But let's consider Samson by the testimony recorded in Judges. If you go to the end of Judges chapter 15, you'll notice that the Bible reads that Samson judged Israel 20 years. He was a judge and he wasn't a short-term judge. He judged for 20 years. All right, let's get into 16. Now in 16, stay with me. I'm gonna move through verses. So stay with me. Judges 16, chapter, uh, verse one. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went into her. Stop right there. It means just what you think it means. He saw a prostitute and he wanted to have her. So that's what he did. Verse number four. Afterward, it happened that he loved a different woman. This is another woman in the Valley of Sorry, whose name was Delilah. Stop right there. Delilah is not the woman <clears throat> from verse number one. Verse number one is an unnamed harlot. Verse number four, now we get to the famous introduction of Delilah in the infamous story of Samson and Delilah. Verse number six, check out their interactions with one another. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, tell you what, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, those that haven't dried, I'm going to become weak like any other man. And so what happens, brothers and sisters, is that Delilah goes and tells her people, her people, uh, she does what he says while he's sleeping. Uh, she goes tell her people, they try to come in and get him. He whoops all of them. Verse 10. Then Delilah said, look, you have mocked me. You lied to me. Now, please tell me what you may be bound with. So Samson said to her, well, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. And so she does so, and they come in and try to get him, but because he had lied, he uh, had all of his strength and he whoops all of them. Verse 13, Delilah said to Samson, until now you've mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of a loom, and so forth and so on. And the same process repeats. Now, watch what happens in verse 15. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered, pestered him daily with these words that she pressed him, that his soul was vexed to death. That means Samson was sick of it. He had had enough. Verse 17, Samson told her all his heart and said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak like any other man. Brothers and sisters, the testimony of verse 20 is very interesting. She said, she, she did what he said. And then she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he got up and he said, I'm gonna do just like I did those other times. I'm gonna shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze feathers and he became a grinder in the prison. Verse 28 reads that after Samson's hair had grown and time had passed, Samson called to the Lord saying, oh Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Verse 30 reads, then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. 
and the temple fell on the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that Samson killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. And now brothers and sisters, let me remind you, fast forwarding to the New Testament, the Hebrews writer says this of Samson, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell you of Samson who through faith subdued kingdoms. <laughs> My brothers and my sister, Samson is a beautiful example of red flag number three, a cavalier attitude, uh, a wasteful attitude. They, they will mess up the matching of your faith and your behavior. You read it as I did. It's clear. Samson was a judge. Samson was a leader. Samson was a man of might. Samson, in just the one chapter we looked at, decided he just wanted to have fun. And so he had a prostitute. Then Samson decided, eh, I think I like that lady over there. So Samson went to go have Delilah. And then Delilah wanted to take him down, but he was like, eh, I think I'll have a little fun right now. I have time. And so he toyed with her, told her lies, demonstrated his strength. And according to the context of the text, this went on not for just a day or two, but this went on for quite some time as Samson dug in to this attitude. Having been appointed by God to do something great, he had a wasteful cavalier attitude. Now, Samson clearly isn't a New Testament example. He's not in this new dispensation. He, he's not in this New Testament covenant of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But I pray that you'll be able to understand why he actually is a marvelous example of why we should be careful of having this kind of attitude. I want you to notice about Samson that he was ordained before his birth. He frequently had the Holy Spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord, as the Bible says, to come upon him mightily. Uh, Samson lived in a world that clearly provided him opportunities to live in the freedom and happiness of holiness or to indulge in the poisonous pleasure of sin. Samson was never left completely alone by God. And Samson is counted amongst the faithful. And I pray that you can see that that's your story. Not, not his story, but I'm talking about the setup of his life is your story. Because you see, like him, you have been ordained by God before you were placed in your mother's womb. Having been fearfully and wonderfully designed, you also have access to God, but you have it even more so. You have 24 seven access to the Holy Spirit of God, who the Bible faithfully says, indwells within the believers of Christ Jesus. You also live in a world that provides you nonstop access to the happiness and freedom of holiness or the poisonous pleasures of sin. Uh, you also, are accounted amongst the most faithful because your name has been written in Jesus' book of life. Brothers and sisters, the story is appropriate because if you're not careful, you'll take advantage of your status in eternity. And I would hate for any of us, for any of us, to have the story of our lives read. They loved the Lord, but they were disobedient. They loved the Lord, but they just wouldn't act right. They, they loved the Lord, but, but they just wouldn't do better with what they knew. They loved the Lord, but they always had this whatever attitude and didn't use what was given to them. 
that's not the story that you're intended to leave behind. The chapters of your life that God has written in his book read differently. They read of victory. They read of change. They read of growth. They read of maturity. There's, there, there's a chapter in your book, I'm pretty sure it's there, where it says places he used to go, he don't go no more. Uh, there's a chapter in there that says people she used to see, she don't see no more. There's a chapter in your book, brothers and sisters, that said things they used to do, they don't do anymore. That's the story. Brothers and sisters, ultimately, it's in your best interest to live your best life. Uh, why flirt with deadly things? Uh, why have your eyes gouged out? And, and yes, I know that Samson's eyes were physically gouged out, but who wants to have your vision plucked from you? Who, who wants to have purpose gouged out? Who wants to have the sight of faith diminished? Who wants to live in bondage? Yeah, I know that Samson was actually living in real bondage, a grinder in prison. But which of us, who of us, wants to be one that lives in bondage instead of the freedom, acting on the power, talents, gifts, love, compassion, and care that the Holy Ghost has given, that Jesus has imparted? My brothers and my sisters, I'm through. I'm through. Today's message was really quite simple. And it was, if you've got any of those red flags happening in your life, and in some respect, most of us do. All we want to say to you today, is stop acting like that. Stop it. Cut it out. You know better, do better. Don't be cavalier. It ain't no whatever. It's amen and amen. May God bless you richly.